Hi everyone. Uh, this is the final section, uh, final lecture for English 1302 this semester. And in this lecture, I'm going to review some of the key concepts in developing this final comparison essay. And I'm also going to talk a bit about the final exam. So this really, this lecture might be a bit long, but it's going to have two major parts that I want to discuss. And I think you'll see how both, even though they're two very separate assignments, how everything we've been doing all semester long, and if you've had 1301 with me, everything we've done in there has sort of led to this moment in your academic career. Uh, so one of the things to remember is that one of the primary reasons we have writing assignments in, on the college level is for assessment. So an essay is an assessment. What that means is it is used to evaluate your knowledge and your ability to apply that knowledge beyond the parameters of the classroom. This is particularly true in a composition course, but it's going to be true in any of the essays you write uh, in your future academic career. Let's say you continue your studies with us. Uh, I know that numerous classes from political science to sociology, even some mathematics classes, will have a writing assignment. And the goal of that writing assignment is to assess how well you have internalized the things that you have read, the uh, studies that you have completed, the lectures that you have listened to, the discussions you have had about the content. So because of that, there, there's really two main things you need to do in an essay. And I mean, we've talked about a lot of the little elements of creating an essay over the uh, the span of an English 1301 and an English 1302 course, but there's two real main elements you need to have in an essay for it to be effective at this point. These are the major takeaways from composition that are applicable to your future classes and not just literature classes, but any class that has a major essay assessment. One, uh, you need to illustrate for your reader, which is most likely going to be an instructor or professor, that you have read and understood the assigned materials. So this is what I've been talking about in essays when I've commented on papers or I've commented on discussion boards, if you've had discussion boards in your class, uh, that you need to cite the text. You need to go back to the text. Go back to your friendly textbook, the literature textbook. Go back to Northrop Fry's book. Go back to these things and cite. And the same thing's going to hold true for the comparison of Troy Maxson from Fences and Othello from uh, The Tragedy of Othello by William Shakespeare. You're going to need to illustrate for me that you've watched those lecture videos that are present, you've watched that interview with August Wilson, that you've had discussions, that you've read the play and thought about it, not just read it to get specific knowledge, like trivia knowledge, but you've actually read it and thought about how this is meaningful for your life without saying this play is meaningful for my life for this and that uh, you know that's that's garbage but actually showing that you you've used your brain essentially uh, but that beyond first and foremost that you've actually uh, paid attention to the material and that you remember the material so that's really the first thing that uh, a professor or an instructor is going to be looking for in these essay assessments that you'll be writing in the future in which these two essays and every indeed every essay you've written up until this point have been practice at but these are really uh, your capstone 
for that. So you need to illustrate for your reader that you have read and understood the assigned materials. And then you also need to show that you can apply or synthesize the knowledge discussed in the assigned materials. What I mean by this is that you can go beyond simply reiterating what a professor or instructor uh, has told you. Uh, you don't simply spit back out to him or her uh, the things that they have lectured or stated in class. You, you know, I, I keep getting these questions with my face-to-face -face students. You know, what do you want? What, what do you think? Well, the reason they want me to tell them that is because our school systems prior to colleges, and this, this is just the nature of things, has, has trained many of them to think that the way to a good grade is to agree with the teacher or to simply tell the teacher what the teacher has already told them, to show them, show the teacher that they've been listening. But that's not necessarily how you show a professor or instructor that you've been listening on the college level. The way you show them that you've been listening is that you can see the relevance of this material. Uh, you can go beyond the material itself and, and, and see things like how Othello is both real and yet a symbol, uh, how Troy Maxson is both real and a symbol, like we can recognize Troy Maxson as a real person. He is a believable character. We could see somebody like Troy Maxson existing in the real world, but he's also a symbol. He also speaks to something universal. He doesn't speak to just the African-American community. He speaks to the universal relationship between fathers and sons, fathers and daughters, uh, husbands and wives, all these things. And also the notion of, in my case, I'm interpreting him and forcing you to, in a sense, interpret him as a tragic hero and how he fits that tradition that's so essential to our psychology, to our understanding of literature, to our understanding of art. So when you write an essay for an academic class, you really have these two goals in mind. You are going to want to illustrate for the professor or instructor that you have read the material, that you have thought about the material, that you can apply the material. That's the second goal, that you can apply it, that you can make sense of it, you can synthesize it, into things you already know or already have read. You can see how these things are relevant. If nothing else, I hope that this class, even though it's been an online class, has taught you that you are ultimately responsible for making literature relevant. That, you know, that question that people often ask is, what, what is the usefulness of this? Well, literature is probably the most useful of all the subjects you study because it's the subject that includes all the other subjects. You need to understand sociology. You need to understand philosophy. You need to understand religion. You need to understand even mathematics and science if you're reading uh, a science fiction story or a story that has some scientific element. Everything you have learned before or read before exists in the text that you are reading now. That's what Ezra Pound was talking about in his ABC of Reading, that when, when and Northrop Fry too, that when we read one story, we're reading all stories. When we read one story, we are reading all stories, and all stories are, all the stories are, whether they're myths, scripture, poems, plays, even narrative songs, all they are is the story of what it means to be human. And what's more relevant than that? But you have to find that relevance. And that definition is entirely up to you. That's, I mean, what the first assignment was about, defining literature. But I want you, and your other teacher can show you, or want you to show them that you can do this, that you can synthesize that knowledge, that you can arrive at these sort of conclusions and think about the importance of this information in larger context. So how do we do that? Well, if you've had English 1301 with me, let me organize these notes a little better that I'm typing as I am talking. Uh,
if you've had 1301 with me, then you know that uh, there's this element. Let me fix this so it makes a little more sense. Auto formatting in Microsoft Word. I'm sure you've struggled with this some yourselves uh, in formatting for the papers. Uh, that I often talk about a form uh, when I talk about how to write an essay. In 1301, I, I say, you know, the basic form of an academic essay is, and I say you have an introduction. And that introduction begin with an anecdote, a narrative that illustrates an idea. Conclude with your with the thesis subject plus opinion. And that stays pretty true with whatever rhetorical mode you're using, whether you're doing definition, cause and effect, uh, compare contrast, uh, narration, any of those. That's a pretty good similar structure where things start to change a bit is in the body sections. But there is one formal element that needs to exist no matter what that uh, body section structure is. You know, uh, the compare and contrast, which I'll talk about and remind you of again and, and momentarily, is going to vary this just a bit. But the basic structure, which will also apply to your final exam essay, is going to have those body sections. And you always have a minimum of three. Notice the keyword there, minimum minimum you can have more but you should never have less than three uh, are structured as follows you have a topic sentence and the topic sentence is usually the the subtopic that helps you illustrate your thesis if you think about in middle school and early high school you would write something like a three-part thesis where you would say uh, make an argument that something had three qualities and those three qualities then became the topic sentences of each of your body paragraphs. At the time, they called it a body paragraph. Well, in reality, you're not supposed to really, at this level, write a three-part thesis statement. You're supposed to make a claim, an argument, an opinion on your reading, and then uh, your topic sentence still have three ways of supporting that. Uh, There's still the three main ways of supporting that. So we just do away with the three-part in the thesis, but we keep the topic sentence structure. Then after the topic sentence, you have an example. Now, in our case, your example is always going to come from the play or the poem or the short story. In the case of the essay on Troy Maxson and Othello, they're going to come from the play. That's all I've asked you to use. They shouldn't really be coming from secondary sources. But in your research paper, your final exam, the evidence is going to come from that annotated work cited that you've been developing all semester long that's helping you uh, interpret the story. Uh, and it's going to also still come from the story itself. If you're in a sociology class or psychology class, it may come from your readings. It may come from your faculty members' in, uh, lecture. It may come from uh, research that you've done. But the example needs to always be evidence. Always evidence. Okay? So whatever your thesis, your opinion is, it needs to be based on this evidence that you've already identified. And that's why in the case of the research project, you set up a hypothesis and then you set about trying to prove that hypothesis through research. And I kept reiterating, don't worry about changing it. Don't worry about changing it. Change your hypothesis as much as you need to because your research is going to adjust it as you progress. So after that example, you then move on to explaining. And this is where the bulk of your writing is. And this is something students usually slack on a bit. But you really need to explain the example. It's not enough to say that Othello says he's someone who, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he didn't love wisely but too well. That, that notion he says in his last monologue that he should be talked about as somebody who uh, loved too well. Um, is, it doesn't mean anything unless you provide context and interpretation for your reader in your essay. So that's what the explaining is. And usually uh, you do that in the context of your thesis, of your argument. 
And then the next thing you do is you transition. You transition to the next topic sentence. And you repeat that process as often as you need to until you reach the conclusion. And the conclusion in 1301 and earlier in 1302, uh, I talked about two elements in the conclusion. And that's the reiteration of the thesis and the so what question. Answering the so what. Why is this relevant? Why is that important? If you do both of those things, you're pretty much fulfilling those two basic tasks that writing an essay in an academic setting is requiring of you. Now, how has it changed? Well, it, it is going to change for this compare contrast essay. There's going to be a slight difference here. This section here which is the first three-fourths of your paper. This section here, I have, I want you to basically argue something you might not believe. I want you to argue that Othello and Troy Maxson are tragic heroes. I want you to argue that whether you believe it or not. So this part of the compare contrast, you're going to need to define the tragic hero. What are the elements that you think most are most necessary for a character to be defined as a tragic hero. And those have already been given to you by Aristotle in that section on Oedipus in your textbook. You can go look at that. The key points are there. Things like hamartia, uh, reversal, recognition, trapped by fate, these sorts of concepts. Catastrophe and the creation of catharsis or purgation for the audience where the audience in empathizing for this with these characters is released of their own hamashia. These are the major elements of the tragic hero. You have to define what you think are the most important ones and how they exist in this play. And then you are literally, I am giving you your thesis statement here, your initial thesis statement, that Troy Maxson of Fences, now you would reword it in your own wording, and Othello of the tragedy of Othello the more of Venice both represent tragic heroes. That is the thesis. That's what I want you to argue. I'm literally telling you what I want you to say here. Now, when you go to do a compare contrast, remember comparison has two possible organizational structures for the essay's body section. You can go with point by point where you would have point one, whatever that is, whichever of those elements Harmatia, reversal, recognition, trapped by fate, catastrophe, catharsis, whichever one of those you want to point to as an element of the tragic hero that these two characters both share, and then you would have a section of that point one where you discuss Othello, and a section where you would trust, discuss Troy Maxson, and you want to summarize what's in the play and or paraphrase of what's in the play, you will quote directly from the play. So you need to go look at the Writing Matters textbook or Al at Purdue and see how to cite 
in text for a play. That's very, very important. Remember, I'm also assessing your ability to use these textbooks because I'm not always going to be here to tell, well, I'm not going to be here to tell you after this semester how to use those textbooks to cite. And that's something your teachers are going to be expecting you to know how to do. Okay, so then you would move on to point two and do the same thing. And you remember this is still, you're still using that example explain transition in each of these paragraphs, but your example explain transition might have to be repeated because you're going to deal with Othello, then Troy Maxson, then Othello, then Troy Maxson, and you're going to divide it about each point of comparison. And repeat. Now that's one possibility. You may also do what's called subject by subject, where you do a section on Othello and you talk about point one and you talk about point two and you talk about point three and you use the example and explain and transition with that and then you do a section with Troy Maxson from Fences and you do point one, point two, point three now, I'm not going to tell you what these points should be. You should know that from your reading. I've given you a list of possible points to use. These are not exclusive. There might be others that define the tragic hero. I've given you some sources for it. I've given you some contextual interviews and lectures that should help you interpret things like fences that might have been difficult for you. There's uh, film versions of Othello you can watch to help you interpret that as well. Just be sure that you're focusing on the play itself, the text of the play itself, more than the productions because the productions uh, interpret the play differently as you can see in that uh, those two scenes, the one with Denzel Washington playing Troy Maxson and the one with James Earl Jones playing Troy Maxson and the different reactions and the Denzel Washington one the reactions are very humorous. They're very funny. People are laughing at what's going on here. And the James Earl Jones one, people don't laugh. It seems much more harsh. It seems much colder. So there's something uh, about that that's interesting and something you need to keep in mind with theatrical literature is the ability uh, for the same text to be interpreted different ways. and delivered different ways and why that is important. Those are important concepts for you to grasp. Now, the uh, next concept I want to discuss here with this though is after you have developed this, decided on some sort of body section organization, whether it is point by point uh, or subject by subject, this is really you illustrating for me, this is that part where you illustrate for me, that's where you do this first part, where you illustrate for me that you have done the reading, that you understand the reading, and that you understand how these two characters can fit a tragic hero, how they fit that traditional definition from Aristotle. But then, when you go to write the conclusion of this paper, you'll still use that reiteration of the thesis, but the so what question now is your chance to illustrate for the faculty member how the student has recognized the relevance of this information. 
So in doing that, you have a couple options. You can continue to agree with me that they are tragic heroes. And you can talk about the importance of understanding that for understanding the, the necessity of these plays. Why is it valuable to read these two plays? What can we gain from this experience? Because remember, plays, even more so than the other literature we've read this semester, dramatic literature, has a civic dimension. It started out as a religious ceremony. This is very important to not, for you to not forget that uh, dramatic literature is both real and symbolic in our contemporary world. That when we in encounter a play, the characters on that stage are supposed to be as close as possible to people we would meet every day on the street, but they're also supposed to symbolize these universal values, these archetypes, these things that transcend time. You know, uh, Fences takes place in the 50s. Even the things we know about the 50s all come from pop culture or from our readings. We don't know much about what life was like in the 50s. So Fences, on the one hand, is very close to the African-American experience in the 50s. But these characters, even though they're believable and they seem very real to us, we, we have Gar Gabriel who believes he's Archangel Gabriel. And he we have that ending of the play where the gates of heaven are are wide open. Hey, what's the gates of heaven doing in the play? That's not realism. That's all symbolism. We have the fact that Troy Maxson is talking about wrestling the, the death and, and how he's not going to go easy. And all those elements are in that play. And that's all symbolism. So you can agree with me. You've already shown me you understand this concept. In the conclusion, you can continue to agree with me and you can talk about why that's vital and meaningful and relevant. Or you can disagree with me. And you can say that Troy Maxson isn't really a tragic hero. We know a fellow fits it because, heck, are we going to argue with Bill Shakespeare? But you may even want to be brave and argue with Bill Shakespeare. People have done that a lot. That's up to you. But th the thing here is, if you think about this logically, it makes a lot of sense. In order to make a valid argument, a argument that will sway people to your position, it's usually a good idea to present evidence first to show that you can see both sides of the argument. Present the evidence to show that you don't have the education, that you have the knowledge and then proceed to express your viewpoint. Putting your viewpoint first and then adding the evidence doesn't always work to make an effective argument. And indeed, this is the way a lot of academic papers are structured. Uh, if you were to uh, write a paper, let's say, for a science class, or if you look at some of those articles for your science classes, how this is like future academic papers. They're usually divided into three parts. You have the introduction, where you state a problem and present your hypothesis. Then you have a review of literature, which is basically what this part is here. This, whichever version you pick point by point, are subject by subject. Remember, those are two different options. You don't have to do both. Pick one or the other. Uh, that's what you're doing in this paper. You're reviewing the literature, the two plays. And what uh, people have said before, what I've said is that they're tragic heroes. So you're showing me you can do that. And then you would lead into, from that review of literature, uh, the findings of your research. explanation of experimental process. And then you would conclude with the importance of these findings. And you see how throughout the, the, the center of each of these things 
is the idea of evidence. Evidence, evidence, everything needs to come from sources, from observations, from experimentation, from the scientific method. Basically, any of your ideas or positions cannot just come from here. They have to come from here and from here. Very, very important. If you want to have any validity in an academic setting, it cannot just be here. That's great for creative work. That's great for your personal life. But that is not what you want to do in an essay and not what you want to show in the essay. That doesn't mean that your essay should be purely dispassionate. Uh, you want to write about things that are meaningful to you and hopefully you get to take classes that are meaningful to you. Hopefully you get to conduct research that's meaningful for you in the future. But this is how all the things that you've been doing in 1301 in 1302, this is how it all comes together and how it's actually going to be useful beyond this class. That's the relevance of it. Okay, So again, this is the paper, the structure of the paper that you are submitting uh, shortly, the last regular essay of the semester. I'm going to highlight it in blue for you. All this yellow stuff, that's organization. That's that how you organize it, the basic stuff we've talked about, 1301, helping you to understand. I'm going to take off the highlights so it's not confusing. Uh, to, to remember those things, those things that need to be in your text, in, in the essay itself, even with this structure. This is how you will use this past the class. Now that you're finishing the class, and if you pass the class itself, uh, this is how uh, this will continue on and these elements will exist in future writings for your for your studies, whatever those studies might be. Uh, almost every class will have an essay assessment of some sort in the future. That's just uh, the basics of college. Writing is very much emphasized on the college level. Now, I'm not going to tell you any more about the play because frankly it's your responsibility to have read the play to identify these things, to do these readings, and that's one of the things I'm assessing is to make sure that you've read the play and that you can understand it yourself. I, I mean, at this point, you really ought to be able to interpret this play yourself using the contextual evidence I've given you. And there have been a lot of good conversations I've noticed on the discussion board, so I'm really quite proud of that. I have, I've been kind of staying out of this one because I just want to see what y'all do. Uh, and I want to see what y'all think uh, on your own for those classes that are seeing this that have discussion boards. How does this relate to your exam? Recall that at the very beginning of the research project, we talked about this idea of developing a thesis, a hypothesis, based on a literary lens, that we can understand literature through these different lenses, like psychology and sociology and economics, all these different things, because literature, again, is relevant because it's the topic that really includes all the other topics, and help, it helps to have some kind of knowledge base in all the other topics in order to talk about it. So you, you develop this hypothesis, and, and you know, uh, you continue to develop it. it it's, it's not something that you might even feel comfortable with yet, uh, what you have. And you're welcome to continue developing it right up until the day you write the exam. Uh, you open up that uh, exam and, and do it. And you have all these sources to support that hypothesis. You have the short story, you have a lecture video, you have an article, you have a website. You can add more to it if you want. Just stay away from things like study.com and about.com and Wikipedia. Do not quote those things. That's not reliable research for an academic setting. Uh, in fact, please don't ever do it outside of this class. You know, if you do pass the course, do not ever cite those things, uh, spark notes, um, you know, schmoop.com, all these websites that come up who that do the thinking for you. It, we want to see your thinking, not their thinking. I want to see your thinking. Uh, so you have these sites and you have these sources. Now, in that essay, you have a chance to, to argue your hypothesis. You, you, you introduce the story, you talk about the story, what's the problem of the story? The problem of the story is none of those stories have messages that are clear 
themes that are, come right out and they say, this is what the story is about. Pay attention to this message. Most short stories aren't like that. So you've had to think about what it might be about using this lens. And now you have to prove it. So whatever you've come to the conclusion that the story is about and what we should take away from the story needs to be supported by secondary evidence and a close reading of the short story where you cite those things correctly. A few pointers uh, in that essay that you type up, it's going to be typed into a quiz box. So you're not going to be able to do hanging indents or double space like you traditionally do with MLA. But you can do some things to kind of space it out a bit. I'm not worried about length. Quality over quantity is always the number one issue. You want to have a quality piece of writing rather than an extremely long piece of writing. You only have about two hours once you open that box in order to type the essay. So you may want to do some pre-writing in a Microsoft Word document, develop some ideas. You've already done the annotated works cited, so you already have your works cited entry. You already have hopefully your quotes that you're supposed to have if you've been doing it correctly. So really it's just about doing the explanations, the topic sentences, clearly stating your hypothesis, the introduction, and that conclusion explaining the relevance of the story and how it connects to some of these bigger ideas and that we've been talking about all semester, like what is literature, uh, the, the conversation we had at the very beginning. And that's your task in the final exam. You have two hours to do it. Uh, once you open the quiz, you have to complete it in that two-hour time frame. You cannot close it and then reopen it because after two hours it closes. So once it's open, it's open. It won't allow you to resubmit uh, at all. So it's very important that uh, you, you don't open that until you are prepared to do it. I will not reopen that quiz for you uh, just at a time. So you need to read the instructions, prepare very well before moving forward, and then type it in the time setting. But all of this, which will be attached to this lecture video, which will be posted in the final exam, uh, module and I'll also post it I think in the news feed uh, at least for for the first semester I use this lecture video uh, I'll have this document there for you and all of this applies you know you're not writing a compare and contrast for the final exam that's the Troy Maxson Othello essay that's the final essay before the final exam the final exam that you'll be working on next week that you've been working on all semester it is a research paper but it's a timed uh, response to research, uh, showing me that you can pull together all these things that you've learned this semester to analyze a short story. So some final thoughts since this is my final lecture. I realize that a number of my students aren't going to go on to be uh, scholars of literature. I hope that you do. I think literature is fascinating and despite what some politicians might tell you in this day and age, I think we have quite a lot of plumbers and electricians. Those are very noble pursuits, but it's always nice to have plumbers and electricians that have compassion and empathy for people who are different than them. So literature is still valid and valuable for plumbers and electricians and carpenters and uh, pro fishermen and uh, scientists. In fact, lots of scientists. Um, really benefit from the study of literature. But I do realize that you, you may never read a play or short story or, or home again. But I hope you still see the value in them now. And I hope that you understand sort of the, the logical structures that I've been trying to express in this semester. And then again, if you had English 1301 with me in that semester, because really composition and rhetoric is a lot about logic and how we express ourselves. So even if you don't plan on writing another essay, <laughs> which if you plan on continuing your studies, I don't know how you're going to get away with not writing another essay, but let's say you, you somehow manage it. Hopefully the act of organizing your thoughts in this way has improved your ability to express yourself and express yourself in a way that people will support your positions. You know, our economy is changing at such a rapid rate that it's, it's, it's frightening. It's catastrophic change. Uh, jobs that existed 20 years ago no longer exist. And many of the jobs that 
our students are training for won't exist in 20 years. So the ability to think, to read, to analyze, to apply what is read, and, and, and to see its connection to other things, and then to express that to other people, that is a skill that will never go away unless they invent thinking robots that can do it for us, which they might, who knows? <laughs> if they do that, we're all doomed. Uh, but for the time being, as far as we know, we are the only creatures in the cosmos that can do that. And it's something that is badly needed in our world. And so in a way, I'd say what we're studying here is the most relevant, most important subject. Because literature, as Northrop Price says in, in our early lectures and early discussions, begins in the imagination. And everything that's good in human society, in civilization, began in the imagination. Computers, the internet, cars, planes, medicines, if people didn't imagine those things, they wouldn't exist. In fact, they didn't exist until they were uh, thought into being. And so literature takes these primitive notions that we have and allows us to imagine ourselves transcending those primitive notions, our base instincts. Uh, and through it, it allows us to create a better world or a worse world. It really depends because imagination is such a powerful thing. And I hope that you've learned about that. And you can at least appreciate that even if uh, you hope to never read another poem again. It's been a good semester. It's been an interesting semester. I've enjoyed reading your essays. I look forward to reading these last two pieces of writing for you. Grades are posted through the banner system. I do not release grades through email, never have, but you do will you will get some updated grades through D2L. Of course, the final grade is still up to uh, interpretation, uh, so don't always trust the D2L grade as equaling the grade and banner. Um, as always, quizzes are still available right up until the final exam, unless they are a quiz that requires manual grading. I may not get a chance to get those graded. Uh, if you wait that long to retake them. So uh, if you are looking for a way to improve your average, you may go back and retake some of those older quizzes, even the syllabus quiz. It never hurts to, to see how what I've just talked about actually connects to your student learning outcomes that I'm supposed to evaluate to make sure you pass the class. Uh, looking at those things, you can say, hey, well, Dr. Rathers uh, really is holding me to these. I hope you've enjoyed the class and the readings. Uh, literature, again, is, is literature has has been very important in my own life, and I hope that uh, even if you don't pursue it as a field of study, that it will be important in your own. So that's all I have. Uh, enjoy your break, and uh, maybe I'll see you again in a literature class in the future. Thank you.